Hey there, we are so thankful that you have made the choice to watch one of ACC's messages online. You know, as you are watching and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at your phone or your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. But you know, we say you belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means we would love to have you join us during one, our, one of our Sunday services at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. So we would love to have you jump into this message and we're believing God is gonna do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church. I think we all know what happens right after that, right? They pull into the parking lot and they get out holding hands. Oh, they greet our greeters at the door. We're blessed. Yeah, you all know what I'm talking about. Uh, hey, my name's Matt. I serve at ACC as a lead pastor. Really glad to have you here because we are starting a brand new series today called Why Church? Essentially, it's a, a five-week series where we're going to explore some really practical reasons why being a part of this gathering that we, we kind of do on a weekly basis and life groups and all the times that we spend time getting together. Why is this important? Why should you value opportunities to, to be in God's house? And we're going to explore that over these next five weeks, and I'm excited about it. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be relevant. It's going to be important. But let's start uh, today with a word of prayer. Would you join me? Father, right now I ask that you would speak through me, that you would uh, teach each of us in a really kind of obvious and clear way what it is that we can do with your teaching today and how we can apply it to our lives. We fully know that you are a God that is always awesome and always right, always worthy of our praise and worship. And as we gather today, some people I know in this room want to be here and others don't. And I just pray that you would speak to each of us in our own way, that we would walk out of this space today more like you and more like your son. We love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, would you do me a favor? Grab your Bible and open to a book that you probably forgot exists, the book of Haggai. All right, grab your Bible and turn to Haggai. If you're thinking, I didn't know that was a book of the Bible, that's all right. Uh, it's at the end of the Old Testament right between the two Z books of the Bible. You got two books that start with Z, right in between them you got Haggai. It's a short little chapter. I want to encourage you to find that. You have a little bit of time before we get there. Hey, you know what, by the way, that phrase that I just said, open your Bibles to, I think that's a phrase that isn't said often enough in church, and I think that at ACC we also are guilty of that. We sometimes get so used to the technology that we have behind us. We have all the Bible verses we put on the screen. So it's, it's sometimes easy for us to not actually take the time to bring, number one, bring your own Bible to church if you have one and open it up together, right? We want to open up the Word of God and we want to explore how to use it together. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, you can reach down into the chair back in front of you. There's a copy of the Bible there. And if you don't own a Bible at all, just write your name on that Bible and take it with you. It's our gift to you. Because we think that all of us in this room should own a copy of God's Word. All right, so at this moment, all of you are opening up the Bible. You're finding the book of Haggai. If you're using one of our chair Bibles, it's on page 565. All right, hey, before we get started, I think it's important to explain what we mean when we say the words why and when we say the words church. What are we talking about? Are we... It's important sometimes just to define terms, make sure we're all on the same page. And I want to start with the word church, right? What do we mean when we're asking the question, why church? And a lot of us, right, the, the natural idea that comes to our minds when we say, hey, I'm going to church, what we mean is I'm going to 710 Aqua Heart Road, I'm going to this building, and I'm going to walk into it, right? That's what we mean by going to church. But we know that the church is not a building, right? The church is not some bricks and, and drywall and paint, right? The church is actually a body of believers. So if all of us were to gather in the parking lot, the church would be in the parking lot. If all of us were to gather at the high school, the church would be at the high school. The church wouldn't be here, right? So when we talk about church, we're talking about where, where believers, like-minded believers, gather together. Uh, that can happen on Sunday mornings, and it does. 
They can happen in your life group. Your church can gather in a life group setting. There's all sorts of ways. But we're, when we're talking about church, we're saying why should we find any value in gathering together with other believers regularly? I want to add to that in Hebrews 10, 25, it says this, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So essentially what's being said in this passage is, hey church, let's not neglect the importance of joining together and creating the church by gathering together with other believers. It's an important part. So that leads us to the other question of why? Let's, let's define this word why for a moment. Why is another really important word, and it's, it's one of these words that I think we all need to ask more often about all sorts of areas of our lives. Think about it. A why is, is a really, a, one way that we can see this word defined, if you're already open to the book of Haggai, how many of you have an NIV Bible, that your translation is NIV? All right, if you look at ver, uh, verse 5 and verse 7, you're going to see a definition of the word why. Uh, essentially what God says is this. He says, give careful thought to your ways. That's essentially what the word why means. It means, hey, church, let's give really careful thought to the things that we say yes to and the things that we say no to. Let's put a little bit of energy, a mental energy, into asking the question, why? Why this and not that? In fact, I want you to think about why this way. Asking why allows you to choose the what's in your life. You hear that? Asking why allows you to choose the what's in your life. Some of the questions that, that get answered when you ask why is what belongs in my life? What should I be doing right now? What matters? What doesn't matter? These are questions that when you ask why, we're talking about all sorts of areas, like why should I be doing this hobby? Why should I have this job? Why should I go here? Versus the, all of those whys essentially lead us to answering the what. What is most important? What should be on the front burner? What should be on the back burner? What should I do now? What should I do tomorrow? All of those prioritizing questions get answered when we ask why. So what we're doing in this series is we're asking that why question, but we're asking it about church. Why should we find any value at all in gathering together as believers? Why should I be here? Why should I get out of bed? Why should I be in a life group? Why is this thing important? There's an author named Albert Gray, and he did a, a study and then wrote an article about the kind of a common denominator of people who are successful, and this is what he came up with. The common denominator of success is not hard work or good fortune. It's putting first things first. So if you want to have a successful life, you're going to ask the question why often, because if you are constantly not asking why, and you're constantly just taking everything as it comes and doing things that just whatever, and you're not thinking about it and not prioritizing it, not putting first things first, you end up with your life all kind of as a mess, a little bit chaotic. So if we can ask this question, why church? And maybe by the end of this, this five-week series, you'll think, I decided after everything that I saw in God's Word that, I, uh, that, that church shouldn't be a priority. I doubt it, because I know God's Word is really clear that when we ask this question, why? Why should I make this a priority in my life? Why should this be important for my family and my kids? You'll see that God's word is really clear. So now all of you should have had plenty of time to turn to Haggai. And I want to give you a little bit of background. The context of this book is really important before we dive in and explore its meaning and what's being said in, in this. So Haggai was a prophet. And a prophet essentially means it's someone who speaks to God's people on behalf of God. So God would speak to the prophet and the prophet would then say, this is what God wants to say to you. So, prophet, uh, so Haggai was one of these prophets. Now the timing of his, his ministry, his, uh, his prophetic ministry, right, was essentially this. All of God's people uh, had been warned for years and years and years. All throughout, remember Solomon, and he, Solomon built this incredible temple, and all of the people lived in Jerusalem, 
And then God was warning through his prophets, hey, if you keep kind of giving into this idolatry and idolizing other gods and worshiping other gods other than me, I'm going to kick you out. And that's exactly what happens. Now all of God's people were exiled out of Jerusalem. They were all in captivity, and Solomon's temple was destroyed. Now what happens right before Haggai starts is God's people are now out of exile. They are now back in Jerusalem, and they have this newfound freedom. You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever noticed what can happen sometimes when you get freedom for the first time and you don't really know how to handle it? Some of the stupid decisions we make in life. One of the best examples I have of this was I was taking a group of students on a missions trip, and it was up to like the northernmost part of Maine and into Canada. And there was a sixth grader named Dakota who was going on this trip. And the way it worked is parents would give their students some spending money, money that was for them to use however they saw fit during this trip. Now Dakota was given $100, and his parents intended this $100 is for you to use over this eight-day period, okay? Now, as we are driving from Delaware to Maine, we stop about halfway, day one, at a Walmart. (laughs) And Dakota has got this freedom, right? I have $100 in my pocket, and I can use it on whatever I want. He went into Walmart. I, I kid you not. As we were walking back out and as all the groups are gathering back at the vans, he has spent all of his $100 on two big spools this tall of bubble wrap. (laughs) Now, some of you right now are thinking, why? Why did he do that? I have no idea. (laughs) I know for the rest of that week he had a lot of fun with bubble wrap. That's what I know. But here's my point. Sometimes when we experience freedom after not having that freedom, we get to choose for ourselves what we're going to spend our money on and what we're going to spend our time on and what we're going to spend our resources on. And that's exactly what's happening right here as we go into the book of Haggai. God's people now have their freedom again, and they have the ability to decide how they're going to use it. And unfortunately, they don't use it quite right. In fact, let's let's look at that here in Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It says, on August 29th, in the second year of King Darius' reign, the Lord gave a message through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shiltiel, Shiltiel, governor of Judah, and to Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Now, all that sounds really boring, but essentially what he's saying is God gave a message to the leaders of God's people. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies says. The people are saying... Remember, they have all this freedom, and the people are taking their freedom, and this is what they're concluding. The time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. So essentially, Dakota could have hung on to his $100, and he could have realized, I need to spend maybe maybe $10 today and $10 tomorrow, and I can can think of good things and right things to spend this spending money on, or I can do the wrong thing with it because I have the freedom to. And God's people now have the freedom to decide how they're going to use their time And their conclusion is, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Now, in this case, we're talking about a literal temple. Remember, Solomon's temple had been destroyed, and God is thinking, why are they all spending time rebuilding their own lives, kind of investing in themselves, when my church is over here in in kind of piles, in rubble? Essentially, what happened here is that God's people were saying no to church. No to the temple. I'm going to say yes to all these other things. I'm going to say no to that. And what I wanted to do is try to find kind of here and kind of glean from Haggai six different types of reasons, six reasons that people say no to church. I don't know what was going on in the hearts of these people, but I can tell from scripture that there were some different reasons that they were saying no. In fact, here's the first one. Six people that say no to church. The first one we're going to call the avoider. The avoider. Now let me ask you to do me a favor. As we're going through these six, all of us in this room are going to be able to kind of, uh, I don't know, connect with one of these people. You're going to see hints of these inside your own life. Now you might be totally embracer of the church. 
You might be here every time the doors open. You might love Jesus and the church, and that's really good. But even if that's you, I want you to still try to find in these six types of people which one is maybe the one that you struggle with the most, okay? And the first one we call the avoider. This person is likely to say, I love Jesus, but I avoid his church. I love Jesus, but I avoid his church. We can actually read in Haggai 1, the next two verses, verses 3 and 4, it says, Then the Lord sent his message through the prophet Haggai. Why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? Why are you spending all of your time? Essentially, remember, these are God's people. These are people who love God but are saying, no, I'm not excited about rebuilding your church right now. I, I, I like you, but I have no intention of spending any time right now. I'm going to avoid this project called rebuilding the temple. That's what these people are saying. And God is saying, why are you living in luxurious houses? Why are you pouring into your own wants and desires while my house lies in ruins? And I was thinking through, why, why do we, if you're an avoider in this room right now, if this is kind of your personality, you love Jesus, but you're not really a fan of the church, I think there's probably four reasons that, you, that most people avoid church. Let me share them with you. Number one, a potential avoider avoids church to avoid groups. All right, maybe you just don't like being in crowds. Maybe you're an introverted personality, and if you had to choose between doing church alone at home or doing church around other people, every time you're going to choose being alone because you don't like people being around them. Maybe you avoid commitment. You know, you're skeptical ultimately about the church's intentions. Why is the church always asking me to serve? Why is the church always asking me for my money? Like, I, I'm just skeptical of that church. They just want stuff from me. So I'm going to avoid commitment, and I'm just going to kind of keep to myself. And our choice is to avoid church because of our a fear of commitment. Or maybe you're avoiding a person. Seriously, one of the easiest ways to lose someone in a youth ministry is to have two of your students date. Because guess what happens a month later? They're not dating anymore, and only one sticks around. Because what happens? We avoid a person. We're not avoiding church now. We're avoiding an ex. We're avoiding someone that we had a fallout with. Someone kind of maybe borrowed money from us and never paid it back, and now we have this, like, this tension between us. And instead of avoiding God's church, we avoid God's people. So we're avoiding someone. Uh, also avoiders... This one's a little harder to grasp, but avoiders can avoid growth. In other words, we all like to be kind of comfortable, and we don't like to change. So if you tell me that I have to go to a place, and that when I'm around other partners and, and believers and like-minded believers, that I might get challenged and, and explore, have to explore a weakness in my own life so that I can become a better person, uh, I'd rather not do that. I'd rather just keep things the way they are. Ignorance is bliss. And if you're an ignorance is bliss sort of person, you're avoiding growth, right? I don't want to know what my weaknesses are. That way I don't have to worry about them. So our avoiders avoid things for all sorts of reasons. And I want you to know, if you're an avoider, I totally get it because I avoid things for these same reasons. I avoid my dentist, for example, because I don't like discomfort, right? Right? I, I, or I, I don't trust their intentions, right? I'm afraid that they're going to find a poppy seed in my teeth and drill it and fill it, right? So I just, I, I, for whatever reason, I avoid my, my doctor many times because I know every time she's going to tell me I got to lose weight. I don't want to hear that. So let's just stay away, right? We, we prefer to, to avoid things that, that kind of we don't like. Here's another type of person that we experience saying no to church is we call them the intender or the excuser. Either one of these words will work. The intender or the excuser. Now, this person is likely to say, I was going to go to church, but you know what I'm talking about, right? I, I, deep down inside, I know church is important. I know it, that it's something I ought to prioritize. I know it's something that needs to be in my life, but something always gets in the way for the intender or the excuser. This sentence may be completed in a few different ways. Maybe they'll say, hey, I was going to go to church, but my life is a little too busy at this moment. You know, I was going to go to church, but it's really rainy outside. And some of the excuses are really lame. I was going to go to church, but my bed is super comfy. And I relate with this one. Listen, 
There are Sundays, I want you guys to know this, that the only reason I get out of my bed is because you pay me to be here. <laughs> like, we have the most comfortable mattress in the world. It is amazing, and we set the temperature just right, and you know when you wake up, there's the coolest thing in the world is right underneath you, and the, the, the thing you least hate in the world is right next to you, the alarm clock. And we were like, you know, I was going to go to church, but my bed was just a little too comfortable this morning. I was going to go to church, but Sunday is my only day off. I was going to go to church, but Sunday is football day. I was going to go to church, but my kids have this or that or the other thing going on. I was going to go to church, but my golf game needs some work. You fill in the blank. I was going to go to church. I know deep down inside the church is good. I love Jesus, but man, other things keep taking the kind of the front place. And, and I just, I can't fit it in. Sorry. Hmm. In Haggai, back to chapter 1, verses 5 to 8. It says, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies says. Look at what's happening to you. You have planted much, but harvest little. You eat, but are not satisfied. You drink, but are still hungry. You put on clothes, but can't keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. This is what the Lord of heaven's army says. Look at what's happening to you. Now go up into the hills, bring down timber, and rebuild my house. Then I will take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. Essentially what he's saying to his people here is, you guys are, you're trying to find joy and purpose and meaning in all the wrong priorities. You're, you're going out there trying to, to fill your stomach and you're still hungry and you're trying to find something to eat and, or drink and you're still thirsty. You're trying to, to buy things and purchase things and invest in yourself and yet your pockets are like always empty because it's never enough. And all of these things have taken priority over the things that really matter. You're not putting the first things first. And he says, ultimately, knock it off. I'm not honored in that. He says, go up to the hills, grab some wood, and get down here and focus on what's most important. Build my church. Build my temple. And then I'll be honored. You see, they were spending their energy, their money, and their talents on all the wrong things, things that didn't return any real significance in their lives, which all turns out to be pretty futile. I love this, this next line. You ready for this? This, is a, this one will preach. This is what a, a, an, avo- uh, an intender or an excuser, this is like their, their life mantra. The word but keeps their butt out of the church. You like that? That little word, I, I want to go, but I'm not going to get my butt in church. And unfortunately, believe it or not, that's about 40% of you in the room right now. According to statistics, listen to this. You know what uh, the new definition of regular attendance in church is? Regular attendance in church nowadays is considered once per month. So on average, people who say they regularly attend church are coming to be a part of this body of Christ one time out of four and a half. And I want to encourage you, if that's you right now, if, if one time per month this is being prioritized, and the rest of the time you're intending to be here, but it doesn't quite work out. Maybe you fall into this category. Here's another uh, type of person that says no to church. Number three, the taker. The taker is likely to say this, I like the church when it looks and feels the way I want it to. Like, hey, when church sounds the way I want, and when it it, it has the right temperature, and when the volume's exactly what I like, and when the, the whatever, when everything's just the way I want, then I like church, but other, other than that, I don't. And f- you'll notice, if you're a taker, listen, for the most part, you're not a very big fan of church, because there's a lot of people in this room. We actually see an example of this also in Haggai. Let's uh, move over to chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, it says, Does anyone remember this house, the temple, in its former splendor? How, in comparison, does it look to you now? It must seem like nothing at all. But now the Lord says, Be strong, Zerubbabel. Be strong, Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people still left in the land. And now get to work, for I am with you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. My spirit 
remains among you, just as I promised when you came out of Egypt. So do not be afraid. Let me give you the context for what's happening here. Remember, when they're looking at uh, the, the temple that's been destroyed, they were talking about Solomon's temple in all of its splendor. It was big, and it was gigantic, and it was ornate, and every detail was awesome. And all the people, essentially, are looking at the, the temple that Haggai is calling them to build, and it's nothing like it. It's much smaller. It's a lot less ornate. It's, it's not the same temple. And everyone is looking at this new foundation of the temple, and they're saying, What? that's not the way it used to be. That's not the way it was for my parents. That's not the way we used to do it. And they're making all of these, these, these statements essentially saying the church, that's not the way I like it. That's not the way it could be. That's not the way I want it to be. And they're saying all these things and eventually God steps into the situation. He's saying, listen, listen I know you're looking at what's here right now and you're remembering that the, the church uh, of Solomon. You're remembering the temple that Solomon built. But then he, he goes on and he says, you don't know what's coming. And in Haggai 2.9, it says this, the future glory of this temple, the one you're building now, will be greater than its past glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. And in this place, I will bring peace. Let me explain to you why God is saying this statement right here. He's saying, hey, you know this temple right here that we're building that isn't as cool and isn't as big and doesn't look maybe quite the way you want it to look? This temple is the one that Jesus is going to walk in. This temple is the one through whom my son is going to walk through it and teach in it and is going to bring peace to all mankind. This is the temple, not Solomon's temple, this one. So sometimes we get all caught up in the way we think things ought to be and the way we want things to be and the way we think would best suit our needs and we kind of get into a taking mood. If, it, if the church is offering something I want, I take it. If they're not offering something I want, I, I reject it. And we don't realize that God has a plan in different phases of his church and he's doing some incredible things. I want to ask you, have you ever thought a statement like that about Arundel Christian Church? You know, this isn't the way we used to do things. I don't like this as much as I like the last one. David Platt is one of my favorite authors and one of my favorite books, Radical. He writes this. We are giving in to the dangerous temptation to take the Jesus of the Bible and twist him into a version of Jesus that does not infringe on our comfort. But do you and I realize what we are doing at this point? We are molding Jesus into our image. He is beginning to look a lot like us because, after all, that is whom we are most comfortable with. And the danger now is that when we gather in our church buildings to sing and lift up our hands in worship, get this, we may not actually be worshiping the Jesus of the Bible. Instead, we may be worshiping ourselves. I want to encourage you, if you have a way that Jesus has to be to conform to your liking, if there is a way that his church has to be to conform to your liking, what happens is dangerously possible uh, to happen in your life is that when you come in here on a Sunday morning, you're not actually worshiping the Jesus of the Bible, you're worshiping the Jesus you've created and desire and want him to be, which means you're actually worshiping yourself. Here's a fourth person that says no to church. This one is called the appeaser. The appeaser says, I'm not excited about Jesus' church, but I go because I have to. And some of you right now, you're like, oh, that's me. Peg me. And there's three different types of appeasers. One, you're appeasing a spouse. You're here right now because your, your wife tells you you need to be here or your, your husband tells you you have to be here. Your spouse is the only reason that you're in the room right now. For some of you that are kids, maybe young people, the only reason you're here, this is the second one, that you, you're appeasing your parents. You're not really appeasing them. You're forced to be here, right? Staying in bed, staying at home is not an option. You have to be in church. You don't really want to be here, but you got to be here. 
A third type of appeasing is, is a little bit uh, overlooked. And this is the person who, the only person they're appeasing by showing up to church on a Sunday morning is a checkbox in their own head. Meaning the only reason you showed up here this morning is you've decided at some point that being in church is important. So you've created this kind of to-do list of if I go to church, I'll feel better about myself, and if I don't, I'm going to feel guilty. So you're here not to appease a spouse, not to appease a parent, but you're here just to appease your own conscience, maybe. You don't really want to be here, but I go because I have to. I want you to know that I, I get it. I relate with this so much. Let me, let me show you in Haggai 2, 13 and 14. It says, Then Haggai asked, If someone becomes ceremonially unclean by touching a dead person and then touches any of these foods, will the food become defiled? And the priest answered, Yes. Then Haggai responded, That is how it is with this people and this nation, says the Lord. Everything they do and everything they offer is defiled because of their sin. Let me show you what that word, those, those last four words, defiled by their sin, it actually comes from one Hebrew word, tame, which means essentially unworthy. So what this passage is saying is God's people are coming and they're offering fake worship and they're offering disingenuous praise and they're offering kind of nothing of real substance. And what God's saying through the prophet Haggai is what you're doing in this moment is you're offering me stuff that is unworthy. I don't want it. It's not pleasing. It's defiled. So we, we're, we, we suffer from this too, and we have this appeasing mentality. When we say, I'm going to show up to church, just listen. Some of you, you have to be here because your parents tell you you got to be here, and you got to do it. But I want you to know that if you're appeasing a parent or appeasing a spouse or maybe just trying to please your own sensibility in your head, there's, there's something that I want to ask you to consider, to encourage you to, to learn and, and pray that God would instill within you a sincere, genuine love for Jesus and his church. So that when you walk in here, the praise that you're offering up isn't fake, it's not, uh, it's not disingenuous, but it's real. Because the Bible is clear that when we come in here and we, we show up and we just kind of go through the motions, that that is unworthy to our God. And I was saying that I relate to this. There are, I want you to know, there are some Sundays that even as the lead pastor of this church, I wake up in the morning and the only reason I come is because y'all pay me to be here. And I know when I wake up on a Sunday morning and I'm like, man, why today do I not want to? Why am I not more excited about it? Why do I not wake up with this excitement stirring in me to say, man, I can't wait to get to my church? And I think you all know what that means because there are days, there are seasons in our lives where the only reason we show up is to check some box or to make someone happy. And I want you to know I get it. I understand it because I have seasons in my life where the same is true for me. Now, these last two types of people that say no to the church, we're not going to find in the book of Haggai specifically, but I guarantee you they existed. So these are two more types of people that wanted nothing to do with rebuilding the temple. Number five, we call the denier. This person says, I don't care for Jesus or his church, and I stay away from both. I don't care for Jesus or his church, and I stay away from both. If you are in this room right now, and you are a denier, I have two really special things to say to you. Number one, I'm super glad you're here. Aren't we, church? Aren't we glad that a denier is with us in this? <laughs> Number two, we say this often, you don't have to believe like we do before you belong here. This is an incredibly safe place to explore faith to consider, maybe just to ask. I want to encourage you, if you're a denier, even though you don't uh, really claim or believe that a God exists, I want you to say a prayer that goes something like this. God, if you do exist, would you reveal yourself to me? Ask God to show himself to you and keep leaning in. We're really glad you're here. Here's another sixth type of person that avoids the church. 
We call this person the sufferer. The sufferer says, I have been hurt by the church. Maybe they say, I've been hurt by people in the church. I've been hurt by a so-called Christian, and I want nothing to do with it. You know, we decided that we were going to start this five-week series on week one to make sure that we offered an apology just to say, listen, I don't know if you were hurt by a Rundle Christian church. I, I hope not. But my, my gut is that for many of you who are sufferers, the reason you are opposed to being a part of the church, the reason you're not prioritizing being a part of God's church, the reason you're not exploring faith is that someone else, someone along your history who claimed to be a follower of Christ did something to you, said something to you, wronged you in some way. And if that happened to you as a representative of the church, I just want to say this. I'm sorry. But let me, let me encourage you with something. If you were to leave today and go out and buy a used car, and as you're pulling out, you know, a month later, maybe your, your transmission goes, and you then pay to get it fixed, and then uh, you're driving down the road and a tire blows out, and you take it in to get fixed, and then as you're driving, uh, the air conditioning goes out and the transmission goes again. What are you going to say? You're going to say, I hate this car, right? You're probably not going to say, I hate cars, I don't think in general you're going to just ride off vehicles altogether and say, you know what, I want nothing to do with cars the rest of my life. You're going to say, I don't like this car or I don't like this brand of cars. I don't like people or cars who act or think this way. But maybe, maybe you ought to lean in and, and, ex and consider the fact that Arundel Christian Church isn't maybe just like the person or the, the person who claimed to be a follower of Christ that harm harmed you or hurt you in the past. Would you be willing to give us a chance to, to, to be a part of redeeming and reconciling your view of Christianity and the love that God has for you through the way we can love you and help you walk through that pain together? I guess what I'm trying to ask you is don't write off all of faith because of the terrible actions of a few. And I just want you to know, Christianity in our past has done some incredible things, uh, some incredibly horrific things. Some of the decisions and things that we thought were okay with just a hundred years ago, and even the ways that certain people, individuals, have maybe impacted your personal life through their actions. It's, you know, one of the worst things about being alive is people. Because we're all broken, we're all messed up, we're all doomed to hypocrisy of some sort. We all say one thing and do the other. We're all messed up people trying to go through this journey together. And I just want to ask you, hey, give us a shot. I'm sorry for what happened to you in the past. Hey, to close, I want to show you, uh, um, I really like graphs. I don't know if you guys know this about me. I love looking at numbers. I love graphs. I also really love pi. Um, so my favorite kind of graph is a pie graph. And I have a pie graph that I want to show you. These are who should be in church of the people we talked about. You ready? There you go. 100% of you, all right? If you are an avoider, an intender, a taker, an appeaser, a denier, a sufferer, maybe you're an explorer or an embracer. These are two people who like being in the church. Whatever you are, wherever you fall into one of these categories, I want you to know that God's word is crystal clear. There is a reason for you to be here. There is something beneficial for your life. There's a reason that you should take church and make it a, a, a big part of your experience in life. So as we do normally, uh, we finish with this question, what now, God? What should I do with this information? How do I take what we learned today and apply it? And here's what I want to ask you to do. If you're an avoider, an intender, a taker, or an appeaser here, what I want, you to, ask, what I want to ask you to do is commit to being at ACC for the next four weeks. Just a one-month commitment. Be here, all right? If you're a denier or a sufferer, same thing. Make a commitment to being here for the next four weeks. If you can be. I understand that sometimes, excuse me, work takes you out of town or you're on vacation or you're sick or something. But if at all possible, I want to encourage you to be here for the next four weeks. If you're a, an explorer or an embracer, listen. The church, the explorers have nothing to explore without people embracing the church. The denier has nothing to, 
to kind of come and explore in and, and, and see God reveal himself uh, unless we continue to work in and, and allow God to build his church through us. So if you're an embracer explorer, I also want you to commit the next four weeks, be in and a part of this series. Because here's what we're going to do. Every week, we're going to look at a very practical reason why, if you are a believer or a non-believer, you will find value in being a part of God's church. And my favorite thing is every week we have a very specific creative element. We have something that we're going to do that we've never done before every week of this series that we want to make sure you don't miss. So we want to invite you to be a part of that. Let me close with this, uh, this passage. Haggai 2, 18 and 19. It says this. Think about this day. Let me pause right there. Now, Haggai was talking about that day back then. I want to ask us as a church, what if, we, what if God's saying right now, hey, church, think back to, to April 28th when Pastor Matt got up on stage and we kind of rallied around and said, yes, we need to be a part of building the church. Yes, we need to be a part of what God's doing. We need to take our excuses and throw them out. We need to take our fear of, and avoiding and take it out. We need to take our taker personality and throw it out. We need to take all these bad excuses and say, you know what, I'm going to commit to being a part of this. What Haggai's saying here is right now is, hey, rem think about this day. Remember this day. The day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid in your own heart and in your own mind. Think about it carefully. I'm giving you a promise now while the seed is still in the barn. You have not yet harvested your grain and your grapevines, fig trees, pomegranates, and olive trees have not yet produced their crops. But from this day forward, from this day onward, I will bless you. I will bless you, church. This is what God says. If you can say, you know what, this is the day that I decided I'm not going to say no to building God's church. I'm not going to make excuses anymore. I'm going to be here. And you'll be able to look back and remember this day where God says, listen, you didn't even know yet what I was going to do. The harvest wasn't even available yet. But you're going to remember back and say, that was the day that you, got, you started working in my heart. You started blessing me and building uh, my, my faith and maturity in you. Let's pray together. God, I ask that you would help us. We're all different people in this room. We all have different experiences and reasons that sometimes we, we'd rather say no to being a part of the body of believers that gathers on Sunday mornings and gathers in homes all over this community and life groups. God, we have excuses. We have uh, past hang-ups and hurts. We have uh, selfish desires. We have all sorts of things that keep us from you. But we recognize that ultimately you call us to go up onto that mountain, bring down lumber, and build my church. God, we want right now to be a church that's committed to, to doing whatever it takes to build your church to rebuild your temple. Let us not be those who focus on our own luxurious living while your church lies in ruins. God, let me be a church builder. And let me ask, God, that you'd work in all of our hearts. Show us how we need to change and grow. Help us to be here over the next four weeks and beyond. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a staff and as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep down into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on a Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. As a reminder, please remember, you belong at ACC.